Mandela. I've come here to South Africa to find out how he's transformed this country from international villain to a global superstar player. How did he do it? And what can Nelson Mandela's life tell me about being human? Nelson Mandela! For me and millions of people across the globe, Nelson Mandela is the greatest man alive. Where human beings are being oppressed, there is more work to be done. It is in your hands now. Everyone, including the most famous celebrities, want to get close to him. But what did Mandela do to get such an incredible following? I'm traveling across South Africa to unlock the secret behind the Mandela legend and to find out how he transformed this beautiful country. Along the way, I try and score on the rugby field. Witness a raid on one of the world's most dangerous streets. There's a lot of guns. I get up close with some of the junior Mandelas. My grandfather definitely was the strictest grandfather in the world. <laughs> and even meet people who found love because of him. <laughs> I'm Lenora Critchlow, and my other life is an afterlife. I play Annie the ghost in Being Human. But when I was growing up here in West London, there was another man, apart from my dad, of course, who played a big part in my life. That man was Nelson Mandela. My mother's a teacher, so everything's laminated. So we had this huge laminated poster in my um, house of Nelson Mandela and, and quotes, and it had this picture of him kind of coming out the sky. There was a few pictures of us as children, but mostly it was these kind of inspirational quotes. Oh, don't. Hey. Don't. <laughs> no, that's, I was a tomboy, that's why. That's our mum. It's me with my dad. The reason why Mandela was so important for me and my little brother Knowlton was because our dad was fighting for black rights too, here in Britain. I found that one. Sweet victory for Critchlow. No compromise to racism. Dad saw racism firsthand. When I was very young, the police raided the restaurant he ran, and he was wrongfully arrested several times. And then when you see, like, the police and... Just look. Very oppressive. Oppressive and threatening. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's not right. we still got the video my parents made of the moment when Nelson Mandela was released from prison after 27 years. There's Mr Mandela, taking his first steps into a new South Africa. I do remember watching this when I was younger. A bit like, you know, a lot of, of, of Dad's own history and a lot of my childhood stuff. I don't remember when exactly it was. They're kind of like snapshots mm. in my memory. And when I, when I watch it, it kind of triggers those memories of, of growing up. It looks like footage from my past, if you know what I mean. The whole world was gripped by Mandela's release. It meant the end of apartheid the racist system of government in South Africa. That is the man who the world has been waiting to see. And Britain went crazy when Mandela visited London in 1996. I want to assure you that I love each and every one of you here without exception. So this is, this bridge here is that bridge there. Uh, we've got Brixton Station and Atlantic Road here. So under this bridge, in 1996, there was a hell of a lot of people who turned out to see Nelson Mandela. It was like the second coming of Christ. That's <laughs> wow! <laughs> Bring it home again. Yeah. Okay. Everyone was just felt like loving each other because yeah. he's a great man. This is the worst could fail me to really describe the feeling. It was just yeah. I've never felt that feeling. 
about anyone. My brother shook his hand like three times. He kept running to the end of the line. <laughs> How old is your brother? Nine. Nine. See, at nine years old, he knew to get as many yeah. handshakes with Nelson as possible. Every time I look at him, he just has this calm face. It's, it's like it's really then. superficial. It's, it's like, oh, mm. he's a nice man. You can tell. <laughs> yeah. He was here. <laughs> Most of us love Mandela from a distance, but what about the people who actually know him? I'm off to meet Sir Bob Geldof, and straight away he's revealing there's another side to Mandela. There's so many people. Well, he's that got do a fancy, you know, end, even though he's 967 or whatever age he is. You know, he's got to come <laughs> on, like, you know. My word. <laughs> yeah. Well, if he does. Yeah. Like, there you go. I'll fly home yeah. just on that. But the thing is, you actually do want to. I know it's crap, but it's sort of cuddly, you know. I mean, it's, my, it's so bizarre that in my life I get to know uh, someone like Mandela. I mean, you know, and, um, you know, people say who's the most, you know, you've met all these people, who's the most impressive person. It's a terrible cliche, uh, but without a shadow of a doubt, the most impressive person I've ever met is Nelson Mandela, you know, because he's, he's a great guy. He's very funny. Mm. He wears seriously happening clothes. <laughs> Adores women. Loves kids. You know, I mean, what's there not to like in this guy, you know? It's time for me to head to South Africa for the first time ever. I can't wait. But I'm also a bit nervous. Everyone's told me my life's going to get changed. So, uh, change is good. My first impressions of South Africa, oh wow. No wonder so many people come here on holiday. And in just a few weeks, hundreds of thousands of football fans will flood here to see the World Cup. Back in 1995, the country found itself hosting the World Cup played with a different shaped ball. I can't believe my luck. 15 rugby players from the local uni, all to myself. Please don't drop me, this is my business, okay? <laughs> no one's given the South African football team much of a chance of winning the World Cup. But back then, the rugby team got all the way to the final, and Mandela put in a special appearance. Nelson Mandela came into our change room before the game and what wished us say? luck. Well, it was interesting, he didn't, he didn't just come in and say, Good luck, everyone. You know, he came around and shook all our hands, and he had a little, you know, a little message for each person that was, and it was very clear. He knew the game, and he, you know, he, he spoke to each guy about his little role. And most significantly, he wore the Springbok shirt when he came in. You know, and yeah, that yeah, was yeah. just unbelievable. Inspired by Mandela, Joel Stransky scored the winning kick in the last minutes of the match. Shout out, Stan Joel. Oh, oh, oh. yeah! <laughs> so just like that, basically. <laughs> Pretty Still much just it. like that. Do you remember remember the day? Remember the moment? Like if you shut your eyes, can you just hear? <sighs> Probably not. I, I think there, you know, there was so much going on around that time politically that I think our, you know, the, the rugby memories fade. If I think back of some of the things that are most vivid in my mind, it's the political issues. It was Nelson Mandela. It was, you know, the celebrations afterwards and people of all different cultures and races celebrating together. And, mm -hmm. and there's no doubt that the, at the time, the, the nation did unite around us. And, mm, and it absolutely. Was, and it, it, it wasn't because of us, the rugby players. Mm. It was because of Nelson Mandela. <laughs> that was really, I'm right here, guys. At the time, rugby was seen in South Africa as a sport just for the whites. Things are very different now. Ah, token white guy, there's always one. As I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, the fact that you're the token is, is actually quite <laughs> quite a, a new thing yeah, in the sense that it used to be a white man's game. Is that is that true? It's not completely true because there's a lot of rugby played by black people. It's just mm. that it was never 
was never it was never in the limelight. As much as I'm like the only white guy on the team, uh -huh. I enjoy playing for this team. I love it. Yeah. 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 But you know what? Um, at the moment, it's not really a colour thing. No. Uh, a racing. No. Which that's is more, lovely. Yeah. Isn't that nice? It's that's a sport. Really yeah. That doesn't come into it. So here's my next question. Big question is, what does Mr. Mandela mean to you guys? You know when they say someone's a father figure to you mm. and you don't even know that person? Mm. That's Mandela. Everyone has a uh, role model, you know, and I think every child in South Africa would say, it's Mandela. Mm. You know, that's my side. Basically, he's, he's the father of a nation. Like, as he said, I mean, he's, he's a father figure for everyone in this country. Black, white, Indian, color, doesn't matter. He's the father of our country, and that's how I see him. So you like the guy, basically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we love it. We love it. We love it. He's all right. We love it. In a nutshell, huh? Yeah, he's all right, isn't he? In a nutshell, he's This is a hot scrum, guys. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me in. <laughs> it's been moving. I feel very privileged, trust me. Right now, this, this is what we do pre and post the game. It's our war cry. When Nelson Mandela was a young man, South Africa was a very different place. White people, who make up less than 10% of the population, ruled the country. Racist laws made to keep blacks separate from whites meant black people had to live where they were told and couldn't even travel without permission. If the police stop an African and he has forgotten his book of passes, they put him into jail. Blacks were separated from whites in everyday places like beaches, schools, hospitals and buses. Black people didn't have the vote and were third-class citizens in their own country. And if they complained, they were dealt with, often brutally. In 1960, at a place called Sharpville, police shot dead 69 unarmed protesters. This terrible massacre helped convince Nelson Mandela to become a freedom fighter. He set up the armed wing of the government's main opposition, the African National Congress, the ANC. And so the white government threw him in jail. You can set me free or bang me up. Just stop torturing me, tell me what you're gonna do I'm heading to the island prison where Mandela served most of his 27 years inside you can set me free or bang me up. Robin Island was a maximum security, black only, political prison Life there was very tough Hard manual labour was part of the punishment If I was on my way here to be imprisoned on an island I'd be absolutely terrified. I think I'd be very tempted to jump ship. There are no prisoners here now, but they've left the building standing as a reminder of the past. There's a master key. It opens, closes twice. I see, I'm doing it gently. During the prison time, they will really make it, make some serious noise. Because the idea was always to affect you here. Yeah. You want to come in? No. <laughs> no, come in, please. No, I do. Come in. Mandela is a very tall man. When he came in here, he had to bend a little bit. Now, for him to spend 18 years of his life in this space, using these two mats and those four blankets, there was no toilet and shower. And so this is what was used. And if you don't like small spaces, well, this would be the wrong place for you to be in. Do you have a question? Let me give you a moment. Standing here, in Mandela's actual cell, it all starts to feel so much more real, and so much more cruel. Almost 20 years in a place this size. How could anyone cope? 
when apartheid was at its strongest, we needed a symbol that will capture that struggle, and Mandela became that symbol. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of political prisoners were held here in these tiny cells. My guy Dede was one of them. This is the cell I was kept in. Six years and five months of my imprisonment was spent in this cell. You're going to think this is weird, but for me, I've developed this system. When I have my rough days in the prison, tours, when everybody's gone, I come back here. I sit here. Sometimes I cry. Sometimes I think about my father. My father is my hero. And I never got to bur bury my father. They killed my father in such a cruel way. He opened a letter, the letter passed a bomb, and it blew him up. And uh, they found a head there, a torso there, a leg there. My father was reduced to a black plastic bag. You understand? A black plastic bag. I never got to say goodbye. Father's my hero too. Yeah. Went to prison too. Okay. He's still alive, but um, he has, he's ill. Oh man. But you know, I just like you say, Mandela is is the name and the symbol, but there's so many men, and you just think, you know, that these um, I'm just. Cheap life. Yeah. I understand. You know, a black life, an African life is so cheap. That's the thing. That's the thing. This is Luis Obala a double platinum selling massive South African star. In his home township, Luiso is now a bit of a celebrity. When Mandela was in jail, Luiso was growing up on these streets, living every day in fear of the white police. The one thing that really kind of got to me was the way that, you know, the system would actually come in and infiltrate us within our own, you know, like within our, you know, within our own communities. For instance, like there'd be police going up and down, you know, like in trucks, um, day in and day out, you know. On this road, up and down. On this, this road. on this exact road, you know, the thing is, if you're going to call it apartheid and you say that people might be segregated, then leave us alone, do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then, you know, if you don't want us there, then leave us alone. But for kids like Luiso, Nelson Mandela was a hero. Nelson Mandela, yeah, when I grew up, Nelson Mandela was sort of, um, you know, like in the fairy tale when you read the book and you hear about the prince is going to come and, you know, like, we're going to come and save, yeah. you know, the people. That was Nelson Mandela to us. He was sort of like this mythological hero who would one day come out of prison and, you know, like, and save us. You know what I mean? Hi, I'm Lenora. That's my mom. I'm staying the night with Luiso's family. Oh, Lenora, yes, hello, yes, Lenora. Lenora. Pleased to meet you. Before dinner, Luiso lets me in on a little secret. When I was when I was like four, or five years old, and they would ask me, Luiso, what do you want to be when you when you grow up?" I said, "I want to I want to be a white man." 
<laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, and this how sad it was as much Dream like big. maybe. <laughs> That's just dreaming. Because yeah. I thought like, you know, the, I thought that like that was, you yeah. know, that was the change, you know, that eventually would be like, you know, we'd be white people. And, and yeah. that's how life kind of gets better, you know? Oh, there's a lot Ooh, of food. Oh, nice. Thank you very much. Luiso's uncle was involved with the ANC during apartheid. The police arrested him and tried to turn him into an informer. When I was in, in, in that solitary confinement, I was always visited by the security police. They will always beat me, wanted me to, to say what, what they want me to say, you know? Mm. Because what they wanted me is to sell the food that so and so is doing whatever, so that they can go and harass that person and kill them on mm. other instances, you know? So I had to resist myself and say, I cannot give, me, give them this information. It was about, it was about breaking your spirit mm. up to a point where you couldn't rise, you couldn't think, you felt inferior. What, what really strikes me is just the... Whenever you talk about fighting back, it's never from a place of anger, it's never from a place of resentment or blame. Mm. It's much more a thing of, you know, that you, you were fighting for equality. Obviously, this is about Nelson Mandela. Mm. But I, you know, I see, I see where Nelson Mandela gets it from, basically. <laughs> <laughs> As the sun went down, I found out where Luiso gets his musical talent from. Just now I was really flagging and then this music came out of the garage of, of the house we're staying in. I went outside and the choir rehearses in the garage every night. And this music just went straight to my core and just like, it's like an injection of... I don't know, I've never taken Pro Plus, but like Pro Plus, it just invigorated me. And it really kind of, kind of sums up how this place is. It speaks straight to my heart and my soul. And it challenges me. It challenges me to challenge the way I think. Um, you know, I've, I've not met any victims here. Nobody I've spoken to wants to be thought of, would call themselves or would relish the idea of being a victim in any sense of the word. When Mandela was released from prison in 1990, South Africa turned into one big party. People had been waiting for years for this moment. But the moment passed. Almost immediately, the country plunged into bloodshed and violence. Some white people hated the idea that Mandela had been set free. And some of South Africa's rulers deliberately caused violence between the country's different tribes with shocking results. They used to form these columns, almost like the houses. And As a young journalist, Tandika saw the worst of it. You know, um, you see this machete that was very typically used by migrant laborers, like the, the men who are around us now. This, this kind of violence was typically called necklacing. Here you see a man aflame. And um, how it was done is that people would put a necklace over somebody and then ignite it. So it's divide and rule and it's... Divide, divide and rule, rule of the most contract. vicious type. Yeah. To make it look like black on black violence. Yeah. And to, to, to give to the world um, an image of ethnic civil, genocide, yeah, which civil. never happened in this country. Yeah. And the minute that government was out of place and could no longer use state funds to sponsor this kind of thing, you saw a cessation of it. Did you ever see, you know, white foot soldiers attacking? You know what I mean? Like Personally, yes, yeah. they would. Let me show you some pictures ah, of right. them. Here okay. they are. Yeah. Here they are. Everyone was fighting everyone. The country was tearing itself apart. You people, let's get out now very quickly, okay? It was Nelson Mandela who ultimately stopped this violence. 
He told his followers to put down their weapons. Take your guns, your knives, and throw them into the sea. I cherish the idea of a new South Africa, where all South Africans are equal. Mandela's time had come. The white president agreed to his peace plans. Four years after Mandela was set free, there was an election and millions of black South Africans took to the streets to vote for the very first time. It was another incredible day for South Africa and Tandika was in the crowd. I voted for the first time in 94. It was exhilarating because people just stood in the lines and started screaming. But you, would, you know, we didn't scream inside the voting booth because if we were to do so, we would disturb other people's right to vote. And if people have waited like a thousand or a hundred years to vote, you just don't disturb them when they're voting. And then you can really scream afterwards and throw your hands up. <laughs> yeah. I, I wish I could describe such an exciting voting experience for me. It's more like, Lee, have you voted? Oh, <laughs> go in, Mum, go in. But, um, yeah, I, I, have a, I shall never miss my vote again. I shall <laughs> never, I shall, that is a vow. <laughs> people quite happily queuing for hours to cast their vote for the first time as adults. I mean, that's, that is really, um, it's just profound stuff to me. Um, it, it, it's really given me a sense of, I don't know, a very empowering feeling. And to have gone from that level of devastation, violence, turmoil, persecution, discrimination, um, and then to kind of be where they are now, it's really just, I don't know, it's like having a cold shower. You know, it just goes, wow, wow. I, Nelson Mandela, do hereby say to be faithful to the Republic of South Africa. Mandela became the first black president of South Africa in 1994. Overnight, people who had hated each other before joined forces. It's amazing how one man managed to unite such a divided country. But there's another side to this incredible man, his family. Nelson Mandela lost 27 years in prison, but he still found time to have three wives and six children and 27 grandchildren. At 91 years old, he doesn't do interviews. So today, I'm meeting the next best thing, one of his grandsons in Daba. He even looks like him. We're outside one of the prisons that Mandela was held in. Nice to see you. Good how are you doing? You. I'm good. How are you, doing? I'm OK. How is he like as a grandfather? Is he hands-on? Not much hands-on, but whenever you meet him, he'll always ask you what you're doing. He is always interested. And what was your earliest memories of him growing up? He was very strict and he, he used very unconventional ways to try and instill some sort of discipline. I remember I had lost my jersey, uh, mm. school jersey, uh, mm. twice. And obviously he was angry and he was like, you don't have any value for things, you're very careless. Today you must sleep outside, you know? <laughs> so basically... <laughs> Sorry, I like that. Sleep outside. Yeah. Did you lose your jersey again? Nah. Job done? <laughs> sleep outside? <laughs> wow. Did he ever raise his voice? Did he ever... Sometimes he'll be in a good mood. Uh-huh. And he'll be, you know, telling stories one after the other. Uh-huh. Um, sometimes he'll be just in a bad mood, foul mood, and he won't talk or say anything. And uh -huh. when he does talk, it's like, it's very stern, very uh -huh. hard, you know? Uh-huh. Mandela's family is part of a traditional African tribe, which has an extreme way of turning boys into men. You know, we, for some men, we don't get circumcised at birth. Okay. So we get circumcised around about the age of 18. And we go to a mountain. It's like a sacred place for uh, men. Yeah. And only a man can discuss it. And okay. I'm not even allowed to, uh, to say 
especially to a woman, it's even worse yeah, speaking okay. to a woman because well, then you, like, totally you get the worst luck or anything. You can imagine, yeah. you're going to get circumcised, no yeah. anesthetics, no conventional medicine or drugs. It's pure herbs. So you are getting cut with a hot spear that's been chilling in, in flame with hot, you know, sharpened. And you're get, you get treated with, with natural herbs. And as you can imagine, you have to be a man to go through yeah. that whole experience for a month. Yeah, I'll you know? say. But if you want to know more about it... Like they breed their men tough here in South Africa. Maybe that's where Mandela gets his strength from. Before, it felt like I had an almost animated cartoon version of him in my head. And now getting to know him, I'm not, you know, the amount of respect and admiration for him is not at all being, you know, is not wavering or, oh, I'm not sure now. It's, I'm growing in appreciation because he is becoming that much more real to me. In 1999, after five years of being president, Mandela stepped down. He was 80 years old and thought that younger people should be running the country. But instead of retiring like any normal grandfather, Mandela set off on a worldwide mission to get more things done for the country he loved. He used his image and his personality, including his unique taste in shirts, his charm and his celebrity friends, to persuade world leaders and people like you and me to support big causes like Make Poverty History. In this new century, Millions of people in the world's the poorest countries, they are trapped in the prison of poverty. But for Mandela, his biggest campaign of all is also very personal to him. AIDS. You young people, HIV doesn't just happen like getting a cold. Millions of people have died of AIDS in South Africa, including Mandela's own son. Another tragedy of the disease is that now one and a half million children don't have parents. This orphanage, like hundreds of other outreach projects, is part funded by the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. You take them as your children. You don't take them as other person's child. You know that this is my child. And that one is my child, and that one is my child. You treat them the same way. Nasifo is one of the many carers Mandela helps pay for. And so far, Nelson Mandela's raised 50 million pounds to improve the lives of children, involving celebrities and his entire family in the process. Meet my second Mandela grandson, Kwaku. For a long time, um, not just within our family, but within you know this nation, mm. uh, there was a certain belief that HIV and AIDS was a poor man's disease, mm. um, and it really proved that it that it wasn't. Mm. Um, you know, it struck us all, and I think for us, the key was not you know to kind of sweep this under the carpet and act like this hadn't, hadn't happened. You know, was to show people, and again, I you know I talk about my granddad trying to lead by example. Mm. Um, you know, losing his only you know, or his last son, and, um, you know, having the courage to, you know, sit there and tell the world that, you know, he died of HIV and AIDS. And it was hard because a lot of people, you know, wanted to share and, and share in our suffering. Mm. Um, I remember, you know, my uncle's funeral and how massive it was, you know, how many people came to it. Um, and it was endearing because you see this, this huge amount of support, but at the same time, you know, uh, you feel that you do want to have some sort of, yeah. some sort of privacy. Yes. AIDS has touched almost every family in South nose, Africa. Knows what about your hair? But fewer people hair. are now being infected. Yeah. And for me, this place is not sad. It's surprisingly full of hope. Can I get a big hug from everybody? I have to go now. I go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> Squeezed with love.
My journey so far has been packed, and I feel like I've seen so much. The more I see of this amazing country and its people, the more I feel at home. This is a country that knows how to eat, drink, and relax, and how to have a good time. It's funny, you know, sort of one of the very standard ideas that come with Africa is the idea of kind of、uh, you know starvation. Listen, every other place to stop, there's some serious barbecuing going on. So, just for today, just for here, no one's going hungry. Time for a night off in one of Johannesburg's exclusive nightclubs. But in other parts of this city, every night there's a reminder that South Africa still has big problems. Crime is massive on these streets. There are 18,000 murders a year in South Africa, and visitors to the World Cup have been warned to be on their guard. I'm heading for a township called Alexandra. It's got a pretty scary reputation. It's not safe for outsiders to drive here at night, let alone get out of their cars. So I'm joining the police on patrol. Already tonight, a man has been stabbed to death. The police are stopping and searching people, hunting for weapons. Quite alarming about it is the route that we just took. I mean, the police presence was very, very heavy. There's a lot of cars, a lot of vehicles, a lot of guns, a lot of bulletproof vests, and a lot of heads. Like the manpower was a lot.、Um, so, kind of, is a reflection of how you know severe the crime is. If that's that's the counteraction, if you know what I mean. I've noticed the police are not going down any of the side alleys off the main road, and they are staying very close to their support vehicles at all times. Something feels very tense. They're raiding this bar looking for knives and guns, and a man is arrested. The whole area feels very on edge. This is a totally different side to South Africa. It's the morning after, and I've come back to Alex to see what it's like in the daylight. Being here this morning certainly feels like what was all the fuss about last night. Feels safe, feels open and friendly. Something about it being Sunday, and I've seen quite a few people obviously in their Sunday best. Community here feels very strong. So why is there so much violence in this neighbourhood? In the crowd, I get chatting with a woman called Tembe. She knows all about the crime on the streets. December, and this guy came with a gun, and he said, "Give me the phone, or else I'm gonna shoot you." I remember seeing there was one guy. I think he didn't know anything about this area. You know, you would get like you guys. You would come here, but he was coming from like another region. I saw these guys. They went to him, and then they, he had a bag. They took his bag and they shot him. They killed him just like that. 
Tembe offers to take me down the alleys the police didn't want to patrol. Everybody here, they, they all share this toilet, all of them. Over one in four black South Africans are unemployed. And half the black population lives on less than three pounds a day. There's more than ten people in this house. Oh, that's a party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where's their water? People. Where do they, do they have a they water They use supply? the toilet that I showed you. It's got a tap. We go further into the maze of shacks and slum houses. Tembe tells me 50 people live in this building. More than five people sleep here. Oh, yeah. You see? And then each room is um, separated with these sheets. Yeah. So there's still more that side. Okay, there's more. But you can't, I don't know, it's very dark. And they're renting this place. They're renting this place. Okay. Surely it's this poverty that's behind the massive crime problem. The 2010 FIFA World Cup will be organized in South Africa. Nelson Mandela was the centerpiece of the campaign to bring the World Cup to South Africa. There will be 32 nations taking part and millions of people will flock to 10 stadiums across the country. Everywhere I go, I can feel the excitement. Football is a huge passion here. But Nelson Mandela hopes that, as well as an amazing month of international football, the World Cup will bring badly needed money into the country, giving South Africans new jobs, new roads, new businesses, and a new hope for the future. But for all that hope, the problems I've seen in this country are still a long way from being fixed. And I've heard that there are some people in South Africa who have mixed feelings about Mandela. My next stop is a township an hour's drive from Johannesburg and notorious for a massacre 50 years ago, which will never be forgotten. Seppo is a human rights worker. In the first picture that you see here, this where people coming. You can see wow, a that's lot the of march. people. That's, yeah, that's more march. than a, a few hundred. Okay. Uh, you can see they're not armed. They're right. not carrying any arms. This is what happened subsequently. Oh, uh, at the place where we are standing now, you can see all of these people have been shot. Most of them have been shot at the back. Most of them were running away as they've been shot with life ammunition. You know, uh, official statistics say 69 people were killed. Uh, but people suspect that it's much more than that, you know? And that really brought the world attention to the brutality of what was happening in South Africa. Before that, you know, the world was in denial. Very, very significant side because after this massacre, people got to know about what was happening in South Africa. Yeah. Hello. Hi, I'm Lenora. There are still people here who remember that terrible day. Hello, I'm Lenora. So he was shot here. Where you can see the stitches. The individuals who carried out this massacre have never been brought to justice. As part of Mandela's peace plan for South Africa, many horrific crimes on both sides, black and white, were forgiven. When Mandela came to that power, we thought it will have some meaning to us. Mm. I'm still angry even now because what benefit did we get? Nothing. Even now, I'm still like this. I don't have job. I don't, I am just, we are just nothing. To our surprise, <clears throat> the perpetrators were given uh, amnesty. Then Mandela, he just say, make peace. Just uh, for his own sake, because he was the president. And it's not just the older people who are angry. Just a few weeks ago, just before the 50th anniversary of this massacre, 
people went about in rampage, you know, uh, burning hospitals, burning schools. You can see this post office, you know, it's broken there, it's burned. You know, people really very angry that our lives have not changed. I believe that, you know, uh, Nelson Mandela compromised too much. He pondered too much to white fear at the expense of black expectations and black hopes and, and, and all the principles of the struggle. The struggle was not simply about transferring power from white hands to black hands. It was also changing the living conditions of people. And that was betrayed. That never happened. The figure of Nelson Mandela camouflaged the selling out that was happening. That, oh. At that moment, <laughs> that was what other people are. No, no, I, I, is you know? this a, it's an important, uh, one can't ignore yeah. uh, opinions like that. It's the first time on this trip I've heard anything negative about Nelson Mandela. And meeting those two survivors of the Sharpeville massacre has given me a restless night. I found it hard to sleep last night thinking about it. I found it hard to to shut off. I look at these two people in front of me and I feel like I owe you my freedom. I feel like you've paid such a price and they're still paying a price for me to have the opportunities I, I have for, you know, for a couple like my parents to even be okay and have children. Um, you know, just... I feel like I owe them so much. I feel like without these individuals, where would we be? It seems a shame these people who Mandela's worked so hard to help now feel let down. But I'm finding out this is a complicated country. He, Mandela the man, is becoming a lot more three-dimensional, a lot more real, and that brings with it the flaws, the things that aren't, aren't finished, and perhaps some of the things that weren't done so well, if I can say that. Or the mistakes, we all make mistakes. And some black South Africans think the biggest mistake Mandela made was leaving huge amounts of money in the hands of the whites, instead of spreading it around. It brought peace and economic stability to the new nation, but not the equality that Mandela may have wanted. I'm heading to rich white South Africa. Many whites now live in ultra-secure compounds because of the high crime rate. And despite their wealth, a few of them are very unhappy with the new South Africa. Hello, Hi. Joe. Yes. Hi, Joe. I'll let you open up your very secure. Hi, Hi, I'm Lenora. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you too. They weld these bolts to the whole uh, system so that they cannot be taken off the wall. And we have lights here. We've got light over there everywhere just to make sure that there's nothing hiding in any corner and you're in a gated community i mean seriously this does look like prison bars doesn't it it's like the house is built like a cage basically the house is built if there's a fire in here and it's here we can't get out oh my gosh <laughs> can't win johannet has been the victim of violent crime before so everywhere she goes, she carries a walkie-talkie that's connected to a neighbourhood response team. Johannet thinks that Nelson Mandela's project to unite South Africa's people has failed. In terms of the future of South Africa, I think that we have had 16 years uh, to prove that we can stand together and we haven't proven that. Uh, for me personally, I would say that it would be better for my people, for the preservation of our culture and our language to be separated. And how, they, how would that work? Would, I don't quite understand. Well, basically, there is a group in South Africa that is actually working towards this. They are called the Volksraads Verkiesingskommissie. And this commission, what they are trying to do is to gather 
all the people of our culture and vote for our leaders of mm -hmm. our new country. Do you think that's a better goal to be striving for over integration? Yes, I believe it is a better Why? goal because Europe is not one nation. All the countries in Europe have got their own culture and their own language and they want self-determination. If you throw all of them together suddenly, it's not going to work. Is it ridiculous and naive to think that these differences in culture and language in, in South Africa's context could live harmoniously together? Is that a silly thought to you? Well, it's not silly. If it could work, um, it would be great. Um, but I think South Africa is not going in the right direction. Uh, it's not going in the right direction for my people, my Afrikaans people. Um, we are being treated as second-class citizens. That part about being separate and having, you know, her and her people, as she puts it, um, having their own separate part of Africa, their own country in essence, I just like... Ah, uh, this just sounds a bit like repackaged apartheid to me. Next day, I head to Soweto, a world-famous black neighborhood, to meet a South African family who sum up Nelson Mandela's hopes for the country. Knock, knock. Hello. Hello. Hello, Brenda. As a mixed-race couple, Brenda and her fiancé, Verna, can honestly say that they fell in love because of Nelson Mandela. Twenty years ago, their relationship would have been illegal. Now, they have a four-year-old son. So I'm going to just get straight to the point uh, and ask you how you both met. Um, it was 2004. We met through friends that introduced us to each other. It was love ever since. Love at first sight? Yes. <laughs> See, it does happen. It does happen. Thank I'm, I'm convinced it happens. <laughs> it happens. Oh, did yeah. you not know that? It looks like it's news to you. No, no. no. She should know that because yeah. the air was wild like this the morning no, when I was, I did, Yeah, it, I looked weird and <laughs> trust me, I don't think it was love at first sight. You were weird, clearly works. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did your family react to to um, my my grandfather once um, asked my grandmother because he used to come over to you know to where we, we stayed and he would make lunch for my grandmother and, and my grandfather and my grandfather once asked my grandmother did you ever think a white man would be making you lunch today <laughs> you know, and, and she was like no you know she never thought it was going to happen yeah, so. yeah. can I ask what you guys think of Nelson Mandela I think he's a great man mm -hmm. he spent 27 years in jail for me um, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be where I am. Mm. I wouldn't be with a white man, with a colored child. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to go anywhere. For him to come out and not have any grudge against white people mm. or any, any, not just white people, but any race, mm. you know, for him to fight all those years and then come out being the person he is, you know, it, 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 you know, I, 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 there's no words for there's no words for for, for how great Mandela could be, mm. or how great he already is. Mm. Mixed race relationships like this are still not common in South Africa. But I'm pleased to say that most of the people I've met on this trip see nothing wrong with them. And that shows just how far Mandela has brought this nation in 20 years. This place still does have some serious problems. But I'm hopeful, really hopeful for the future here. I've got one last place I want to visit before I head home. I can't meet the man himself, but this place helps me feel close to him. It's the house Nelson Mandela lived in before he was arrested, and the home he returned to after his release. It's actually really nice to be quite still in this place and that 
the rain coming down is something very calming and soothing about it. Something very uh, brings it alive, really. Brings this place alive. I think it helps that I have a very vivid imagination. And I can imagine this place being alive with a family. I think it just really brings home the fact that tea was just, just an ordinary guy. He's done something pretty extraordinary. It's been a long and emotional journey for me. Mandela has achieved so much. He's ended apartheid and avoided civil war. He's forgiven the people who put him in prison and he's given hope to oppressed people all around the world. Yes, Mandela may have made mistakes, but we all do. For me, coming here has convinced me that Nelson Mandela really is the greatest man alive. He shows us that we don't have to be victims of our past, that we can let go of our bitterness, and all of us can achieve greatness.